Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a fantastic morning. My office is a mess. Goodness gracious. Just looking at this setup I have. Not optimal. Hope you're all having a great day. Today is um, Monday. We have to start off with the morning royale. Thanks to Brian Kaufman. He has a fun idea to build community. Every morning we all wake up and we have our coffee together. I guess we've been doing that for a while anyway. But... Now it's official. The morning royale. Good morning, good morning. This is coffee that comes in a tea bag. Look at this giant tea bag. This is a slightly small cup of coffee, or slightly small cup, but a giant tea bag of coffee. From Purity Coffee. It's good. Give it a try. It's definitely convenient. I love the idea of not having, you know, like being able to make the coffee very quickly if you feel inclined. And um, turns out a little coffee mornings have to be a little bit on point because. Life's hectic in the morning. Um, we're still, still on lockdown mode here, so that's nice. We just completed our three betting challenge at PokerCoaching.com. If you have not participated in that, you missed out. There's a tiny chance you can still get in it. I don't know. Let me see if we can still get in it real quick while I, before I tell you all the URL and whatnot. Oh, goodness. Let's see. Give me a second. Maybe closed by now. You know how these things go. Nope, it is closed. You all missed out. Well, anyway, I realize a lot of you completed the three betting challenge. So, today we're going to be answering your questions pertaining to three betting. Ask me anything pertaining to three betting and I'll do my best to answer it. Top of the morning, says Louis Philippe. You had a deep run in a Sunday million. Congrats. Poker is tough. I was watching our poker coaching coach, Michael Acevedo, stream yesterday. He streams in Spanish, so if you speak Spanish natively, that is the uh, stream for you. And he had a tenth place in the in the bigger no, what's it called? Um, whatever the big hundred dollar tournament they have is on on Poker Stars, not the million. They have like the bigger one hundred nine or something. It's like man, that's just brutal because he like first place was something like forty k, and tenth place was something like two thousand dollars, and you're like ugh. There's a big difference between forty k and two thousand dollars. And, I mean, it was just like standard spot where you lost, and that, that happens, right? You can't do a whole lot about it. If someone to your left is three-betting a lot with a wider range, how should you play against him, passive or aggressive? Well, it's not that simple. You have to instead ask, how are they going to respond if you four-bet? If you four-bet and they're going to fold a lot, well, you should, obviously, four-bet a lot, right? If your opponent is going to call a lot, and then just like jam all in on every flop, because that's just how they operate after you continuation bet, then you should instead play a, just a strong linear range and extract maximum value. So it really does depend a ton on what your opponent is doing in addition to the fact that they are three betting decently wide. How should you play bottom? Not sure what bottom means. How should you play the bottom of your range? Well, you should fold the bottom of your range usually. I think you're going to find that you do want to make sure you have some 3-bet bluffs in your range, though. What a lot of people do wrong is they have no 3-bet bluffs in their range, and that gives them a lot of trouble. How should you play bottom pair? Well, it depends on the scenario, obviously, right? When you have a significant range and nut advantage, you usually just want to be betting small on the uncoordinated boards and big on the high card connected boards. Say, for example, someone raises you 3-bet a 6 suited and they call and the flop comes queen, seven, six, you probably just want to be betting small with everything there, right? But say you have ace, 10 on queen, jack, 10, you probably want to be checking because it depends on how your bottom pair lines up with your opponent's range and how the board lines up with the opponent's range, right? It's not just as easy as how do I play bottom pair because bottom pairs are not all the same thing, right? Like ace, 10 is very unlikely to get outdrawn if it is currently the best hand on queen, jack, 10, whereas a6 is pretty likely to get outdrawn on queen 7-6. How do you have better mental longevity? I don't know exactly what you're asking. I'm not a psychologist. But um, don't do things to wreck your brain. And also practice. Get experience doing difficult things for a long period of time. If you 3-bet ace-king out of position and miss on the flop and turn, should you represent high pairs in 3-barrel? Almost certainly no. Because... Presumably, you have better bluffing candidates in your range. This is the thing, right? 
what, what a lot of people do is they only three bet with aces, kings, queens, jacks, and ace, king. And if I guess that's the case, on a low board, maybe you should barrel because ace, king is actually the worst hand in your range. But if you have ace, x offsuit, or ace, x suited, or king, five suited, or king, five offsuit, right? If you have those hands in your range, those are just usually going to be way better bluff candidates because ace, king actually has showdown value. Your marginal made hands with showdown value, ace, king is a marginal made hand. It's not a good one, but it is. Those hands usually want to be checking at some point because if you bet, bet, jam, all the worst hands fold and all the better hands call. And that's not a good result at all. Online poker sites, is it possible to rig them? I'm sure it's possible to do literally anything with a computer. So I guess the answer is yes. Is it possible that I don't exist and I've been a simulation this whole time? For only for all of you. Only for you personally, perhaps. Who knows? Yes, it's possible. Is it likely? Well, it's obviously way more likely on the unlicensed, unregulated sites than it is on the licensed, regulated, publicly traded company sites, right? So be smart. Play on legitimate company. Play on sites owned by legitimate companies. Don't play on sites that are owned by a random dude in a random country you've never heard of. Seems like now a lot of Americans really enjoy playing on sites ran by random dudes in countries you never heard of, though, for some reason. And um, they're going to get burned. But hey, you know, that's the risk you take when you do such things. Does your 3-bet depend on your position and your opponent's opening range? Absolutely. Absolutely. You should not just blindly follow 3-betting charts because those do not take your opponent's strategy into account. You should 3-bet based on what your opponent is doing. When you're three betting, you need to talk about stack depths. Of course you do. I, I assume that was obvious. We're talking about the idea of three betting in general, which implies tiny stack, medium stack, deep stack, super deep stacked, against tight ranges, against loose ranges, in position, out of position, right? All these things are relevant factors. What bankroll did I start out with when I pursued a career in poker? I started playing poker with $50, and I never deposited any additional money. So I'm not sure if that's what you're asking. So maybe $50 is the right answer. Or once I quit my two minimum wage jobs and college, at that point I had about $350,000. So I turned my $50 into $350,000. And at that point I decided I should probably pursue poker uh, much, much more seriously. Patricia Cardner, not Gardner, Cardner wrote some great stuff on the mental aspect of poker. Yes, we have two books together. Where are they? There they are. Peak Poker Performance and Positive Poker. Written by myself and Dr. Dr. Trisha Cardner. Check them out if you have problems with the mental game. Do I do this regularly? Yes. Uh, well, let me see this. Oh, do you need this? Yeah. For what? Um, it's not working on my computer. Let me find it for you because it might be buried in these emails real quick. Let's see what something comes out of the week. Okay, one second. Bring dragon. Sorry, everyone. Give me a second. Uh, what's that teacher's name? Carrie. Carrie. What a flop. I don't know if I have the link. There you go. Sorry. It's okay. Relax. You okay? Uh, sorry, everyone. Do I do this regularly? Yes. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. How do you get notified? Subscribe on YouTube. YouTube.com slash poker coaching. It is right there. Have you considered making your own poker website? To play poker? Absolutely not. I am nowhere near egotistical enough to think that I know anything about running a poker site. Also, I really don't want to do it legitimately and have to relocate and actually live in a non-American country at this point in time. If you do not open, li if you do not open light, they limp and open I have no clue what you're saying here, Chen. How do you feel about three bet or fold in high rack? I also don't, I don't know what a high rack low stakes game is. How do you feel about three bet fold? I mean, you should be three betting and then folding with the bottom of your range, right? And that's what, that's why you're three betting with those hands as a bluff. What's the difference between, difference between linear and polarized? And do the cards always fall under one category? The cards do not always fall under one category. Linear, a linear range is just your absolute best hands. This would be if someone raises, you three bet, aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens, nines, eights, sevens, ace, king, ace, queen, ace, jack, ace, ten, king, queen, king, jack, right? That is a linear range, just all the best hands. 
A polarized range would be if you instead use aces, kings, queens, ace, king, and then a lot of hands that are not quite good enough to call with, like ace, 10 offsuit, maybe um, nine, seven suited, maybe king, five suited, right? However, there are some scenarios where some of those hands will inevitably overlap. Like if under the gun raises and you want a three bet in second position, you may find the, the three betting hands in the and the in both scenarios overlap a little bit. So linear range is just like a line, right? So it's like you start at the top and work your way down. Whereas polarized means the top and the bottom, like the North Pole and the South Pole, right? Is the best to play against opponents the opposite of their style? Mm, sometimes, depends on what they do wrong, right? I mean, I just gave an example right at the top of the show where if the opponent is overly aggressive, your strategy in turn could be to be maniacally aggressive or it could be to only play the best hands. It depends on how they play after the flop, right? So the answer to that question is sometimes. Oh, he means rake. Low rack games mean low rate games. Should you have a three bet folding range in low rate games or high rate games? I mean, yeah. You should always have bluffs in your three betting range. How do you put unknown online players on a range at micro stakes? They all seem to play random cards in random positions. Great. Well, if you tell me their range is actually 100% of hands, which it's not, you're fibbing to yourself. But if you do think their range is 100% of hands, just play play straight up for value, right? I mean, you can just three bet linear ranges. They're going to call you with garbage. And then they're going to have garbage out of position. I mean, it's easy to win when your opponents play any two cards. Like those are the absolute worst players in the world. You make money when your opponents make mistakes. <clears throat> when you started, where did you study from? Back in the day, there were books. I would definitely not recommend the old books that I read to study. Now I have one book I recommend to basically everyone when they are getting started, Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. It's a big book. It's an in-depth book. It's perfect for if you're at home and quarantined right now. It'll give you a lot to study. And by the time you're finished with this, you will understand how to think about ranges and how to play No Limit Hold'em well. You don't have much capital to put into poker because of your parents' restriction. Well, this book is um, 35 bucks listed. You can probably find it on Amazon. JonathanLittlePoker.com slash mastering. Maybe that'll take you right there. You can find it on Amazon cheaper. You can get an ebook probably even cheaper. Two hearts on the flop. How many times do you see another heart on the turn of the river? Do some math. How many cards are there available on the turn? Divided by the total number of cards available on the turn times... Actually, I'm not, I, I'm not exactly sure if that's the math. I don't know how to do the math here, but it doesn't matter. What really matters is how often does it happen. It happens about 40-ish percent of the time. I'm not the best person at statistics. It's important to know what you're good at and what you're not good at. I'm definitely not good at statistics on the fly in the middle of a show. If you 3-bet ace-5 offsuit on the button against the under-the-gun razor, don't do that. <laughs> that would be a big mistake. Flop comes ace-10-7. How would you proceed? Check. You have a very clear marginal made hand against what should be a strong range. You would not want a 3-bet ace-5 offsuit against under-the-gun razor. That is way, 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 way too wide. Way too wide. You'll just get crushed if you do that. You'll get absolutely crushed. Do you have anything on random games? No, I, I am not a... I don't spend my time playing random games that I get to play one, one or two times a year. So I have nothing on these random games. I write it, I write and teach about things that I know. I do not know anything about Deuce of Seven, Triple Draw, Stud, High Low. Don't know anything about these games. I have only played them for about six months straight each. I'm far from the best player in the world at them, and I have no desire to make content just to make content, which is what a lot of content creators do. They just make nonsense content. I try to make content that will actually help you, and if I'm not in the top 1% of a player type at a particular game, or 1% of players at a particular game, I'm not going to make content about that because, well, that's just fooling all of you. I'm not trying to fool all of you. <coughs> Sorry, everyone. There are books for sale on my site. Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash books. Is someone playing in the room you're in? No. You hear someone clicking and whispering. You hear me clicking. I have a mouse. Maybe you hear my, my kids having virtual school right now in the other room. My room is very tiny. I'm actually like touching the walls right now. There's a wall right here. There's a wall right there. And there's a wall right here. It's two walls. It's not a very big room. <laughs> this is a closet. 
How do you play against opponents who call and bet too wide with their ranges? Just play better ranges with them. This is what happens in small stakes games, right? Your opponents just play way too many hands. And against players who play way too many hands, your life is really easy because all you have to do is just play better cards than them. It really is that easy. Just stop playing junk and you'll crush them. Like right here, you know, if guy's three betting you with ace five offsuit, when you open with literally only the best hands, just call them every time and then don't fold and you'll, you'll demolish players like that. When you're playing small stakes games with your newbie buddies, they will call every three bet. Should you three bet if you know that you're going to get called? Yeah, you should three bet for value. Every time you three bet when you're the favorite, you essentially get more out of the pot on average than you put in. So if you put in, let's say, $100 into the, into the pot and your opponent puts in $100, but you get 60% of that back, for every $100 you put in, you get $120 back on average. It doesn't work exactly like that, but that's close enough. So essentially, every time you just put in $100, bucks, you get $120 back. You're just printing money over and over and over again. Can you run a competition where you get to play heads up with our coaches? Maybe. What is a capped range? A capped range or a capped hand means that you don't have the best hands in your range. Typically, the preflop caller, whoever calls last, is capped, preflop at least, because they would have three bet if they had aces, kings, queens, or ace, king, right? So therefore, their range is capped at perhaps jacks and worse and ace, queen and worse, right? On the flop, say I raise, big blind calls, flop comes, whatever, they check, I bet, they just call. The preflop or the flop continuation better is usually uncapped because they would bet all their best hands. And the flop check caller is usually capped because they would have check raised with their best hands, right? <laughs> Your cash game table people go in with any pocket pair. Great, they're just gonna crush them. All you have to do is play good cards. That happens a lot. All you gotta do is play good cards if your opponents play garbage. Hi. Wanna say hello? Yeah. What's your name? Thanks. Are you having a good day? Yeah. Yeah? Did you just have school with your friends? Yeah. Were they nice? Like that. Yeah, they're not, those are not for you. I have to deal with those later. Can you tell everyone bye bye? I'm in the middle of my show. That's a book. You see? Look, it's a book with daddy's face on it. You like it? Yeah, I just look. Yeah? Alright. That's a book on poker. You want to read it one day? Yeah. Alright, we're going to be quarantined for the next six months, so I'll read it to you, okay? All right, let's go. See ya. Say bye-bye. Bye. Love you. Okay. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's see, let's see. Your favorite game is Pot Limit Omaha 8 or better. Any advice on where to play it online? I don't know, any site that has it. All right, I'm clearly way behind on your messages. How would you recommend getting started studying today? Go to pokercoaching.com, sign up, go through all of the content. Start at the earliest homework challenge and work your way forward. If you can do all of that, you will absolutely be crushing your opponents. So B. Flanagan makes this mistake. Someone asked earlier, what are the, what are the exact percentage of the time you get there whenever you have a flush draw? And then we have some very simplified formula. This is not how you accurately figure out how often something happens in statistics. A simple formula will give you a close enough answer, which is actually all you need, but it will not give you an accurate answer. It's important to recognize the difference between a very accurate answer and an estimated answer. But fortunately in poker, an estimated answer is usually good enough. Would you recommend any one-on-one -on -one coaches to help improve your game? That becomes a question of like how much money are you willing to spend on things like that, right? <clears throat> Because, I mean, there's, there are some coaches that you can pay lots of money for that will get you up to speed very quickly, but they cost a lot of money. Alternatively, there are some other coaches who are cheaper who will um, probably do you equally as well. Have I been checked for a coronavirus? No. What is this, is this book? Is it more for cash games or tournaments? It's for both. Notice here, it doesn't say either, which means, assuming you're reading from someone who is, in theory, doing this correctly, in my opinion... It's for both. If it was for tournaments, it would say tournaments. If it was for cash games, it would say cash games. This is for small stakes, no limit hold'em. You send people to float the turn and it is not accepting new people. No, float the turn has basically been enveloped into pokercoaching.com. Go to pokercoaching.com. It is 
very up to date and it has lots of content available for you. Do I know any chip tricks? I guess in theory, yes. I probably don't even know what a sub is. A sub is, what is a sub? I don't know what a sub is. Let's see, let's look it up. Hmm, let's see. We'll pull up over here, see what sub means. See what Google says a sub means. A sub means, it's an ETF apparently. Sub definition, sub meaning, okay. A sub is a submarine or a subscription. Seems like a submarine is the number number one pick there. So a sub is a submarine. But that's just a that's just a shortening of a word. I'm not sure that's exactly accurate. Maybe maybe we have a better definition. Another Merriam-Webster thinks it means substitute. Again, this is just not accurate. Sub means to act as a substitute. Okay, that's what that's what it means. Sub means to act as a substitute. Okay, cool. I presumed it was shortening of a word, but I did not know exactly what it means. You had ace-10, flop comes ace-10-5 of clubs. You raise, opponent re-raises you three times. Call and then don't fold. Hit like, hit subscribe. Some people may think sub means subscriber, subscription, or subscriber. That's just a shortening of another word, but um, seems like the three definitions that the internet gives us. What was the other ones? Submarine, substitute. Submarine and substitute are the ones that makes the most sense. What VPIP preflop raises you think are best? It depends on your position, obviously. You should have different preflop raises and different pre VPIPs from all positions. How wide do you open under the gun in a home game where the players are weak? I don't know, 12, 13, 14% of hand, something like that. In loose games, should you raise more when you're in the blinds? No, you should probably keep the pot manageable when you're in the blinds. From the blinds and loose games, you probably just want to three bet very, very purely for value. Six months, maybe, maybe longer. I've been talking to a lot of people who I'm friends with in the healthcare industry, and they think things are not going to be back 100% normal for like years. Meaning 100% normal, meaning, um, you know, no quarantined areas, everybody working at full capacity, people not working from home as much, et cetera, et cetera. They think that's gonna be years away. In terms of, you know, fully quarantined, who knows? Again, I'm not a virologist and I am not a, an event planner. So my opinion is kind of irrelevant. I just know what people who are professionals tell me personally. Cause the question is, when do we go back to play live poker again? And their answer is, well, uh, probably not for a good long time. Seems like in your game, you three bet, pot, you get pot committed and then, wait, if you three bet, you get pot committed because if they open to 15 and get multiple callers then you make it 75, then you are committed after a flop bet. Well, don't make a flop bet every time, obviously. If you're playing five ways, you should not be betting the flop very often. But yeah, if, if the pot's $300 and you have 200 left, you're pot committed, right? If, if you're gonna play your hand, but you don't only play your hand when your hand's good. You didn't know I was so pessimistic. I'm not pessimistic at all. I think a lot of people think um, realistic and pessimistic means the same thing. Low flops give you a lot of trouble. The consolvers like continuation bet 100% turn is a low blank, now what? Well, you should check. So Fat King Louie, you have to recognize whenever you bet the flop with 100% of your range and your opponent calls with mostly the best hands in their range, or at least the, not the bottom of their range, the ranges get closer to 50-50 range advantage on the flop, or going to the turn, right? So you had a big you were the big favorite on, on the flop, but then once the turn comes, after your opponent check calls your flop bet, they lose all their garbage, but you still have all of your garbage. So now you need to be doing a lot of checking on a lot of turns because the ranges are closer to 50-50. Any advice for people starting online coming from live? You sure better learn to play fundamentally sound. Read this book, Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. Study at pokercoaching.com. The problem a lot of live players have when they go to play online poker is that they're just not actually all that good at playing poker. They're good at reading people and they're good at playing against really, really, really bad players, but they are not good against playing fundament or they're not good when it comes to playing fundamentally sound. And that's a big problem. Ultimate Grinder, I have no clue what you're asking. 
When 3-betting linear from the small blind versus cutoff or button, since our range is relatively wide, should we be continuation betting more polarized? Um, depends on how wide your linear 3-betting range is. Generally, though, if your opponent would 4-bet their best hands, you can continuation bet frequently on most boards, just because you are going to have the range advantage across the board again. But from out of position, you should be checking some, so your marginal made hands are the ones you want to be checking, which means your betting range should be somewhat linear. How do you feel about loose aggressive players making big bets when they have position? I mean, it's, it's good if their opponents fold too often. What's the safest online cash game? I don't even know what this means. How do you improve your mental game? Recognize what is likely to happen and don't be surprised when it happens. For example, a lot of people here are saying, six months, I can't believe this, I'm outraged. It could happen, why couldn't it happen, right? If people continue getting sick and people are not getting better and supply chains are stretched and unemployment is gigantic, why would you think that things could not stay crazy for six months, right? So it's, it's possible. Alternatively, maybe things go back to normal um, by Easter, right? I doubt it. When's Easter? Next week? I doubt we're going to be back to normal by next week. But hey, you never know. I bet on six months way before I bet on Easter. All right. Strategic underbet question mark. This is not, this is not a very good question. Please stream myself playing online. I do not sit around playing online poker. I have a lot going on in life. Should you buy Bitcoin? Um, I've had a pretty solid amount ready to load up anytime Bitcoin gets down to about $4,000. I've had many, many people in the know who are not buying any until it gets down to about $3,500. I figure if they're buying $3,500, I'll probably buy slightly before them because they're probably a little bit nitty. That If it ever dips down to $4,000, though, we're probably going to be semi all in. Um, let's see. Family show, we got kids learning about ranges. Of course we do. Yeah, click like, click subscribe, says Kevin. Submarine sandwich? Nope. Submarine. Sub means submarine. The um, actual, this thing, this device that goes underneath the water. That is what a sub is, according to the internet. Or a subscription or a substitute. It is definitely not a person, is what a lot of people want to think it is. A sub is not a person. Is it possible to upgrade? Yes. If you have any questions, send us an email at support at pokercoaching.com. We'll be happy to answer your questions. You had Ace Jack on Ace Ace Jack. X Ace. Do you ever fold the boat? You lose to what? Ace King? Wait, what? Ace Jack on Ace Jack Ace X Ace. No, you have quads. Um, was there straight flush available? No, you're not folding. You're not folding quads. You're a little bit more negative today. I'm actually actually feeling pretty good today. Oh, goodness, goodness. Do you believe we need luck in poker as well? Um, you need luck in the short term. You need luck in the short term in all things, right? Think about this. So at nighttime, sometimes I wake up to go pee and then I go back to bed. Or sometimes I wake up and James has to go pee and I help him go pee and then I go back to bed. In our bed... There is a post on one of the uh, legs of the bed that I will hit my leg on one out of, I don't know, a hundred times I walk by it. When I hit my leg on that bed, am I playing poorly or am I unlucky? Which one is it? Bad play or bad luck? I don't know. It's probably bad play, but it could be bad luck. Either way, if I know I'm going to hit it one out of a hundred times, whenever I hit it, I really shouldn't be all that mad about it because I know I'm going to hit it one out of a hundred times, right? So if you just get bad luck, who cares? Like I said, I was watching Michael Acevedo. He wrote Modern Poker Theory, that book right over there. He wrote Modern Poker Theory. And last night, he found himself in a spot where he was down to 10 players in a decently big online tournament. And button raised. He had ace six suited in the small blind, 15 or 20 big blinds, easy all in, got called by ace king and lost. Is that lucky or unlucky? Well, it's obviously unlucky, but still is a very profitable play to shove, right? Do you have a video on suited connectors? I have a video on how to play your whole range. This is a problem you have right here, Derek, is you're worried about how to play a specific type of hand. Instead, you want to be worried about how to play your whole range across the board. Should you trust your observations or should you play GTO against unknowns? No one is actually an unknown. That's what I think a lot of people don't realize is no one is an unknown player. You have a lot of reads on a lot of players. Like if you're playing a 1-2 no limit live game, you have a lot of reads already because these players are playing 1-2 no limit. As opposed to playing high stakes 
cash games, right? So it implies they're actually not that good at poker already. So no, you shouldn't play GTO against bad players. You should adjust to take advantage of what the typical bad player in those games do, does incorrectly. What do you think about having a stop loss and a profit loss? Profit loss or profit stops are awful because if you're winning, presumably the game is soft. If you're losing, I think that's not such a terrible idea because when you're losing, presumably the game is tough. But if you're crushing the games, you should not quit because you're up X amount. That's, that would be a disaster. Unless, of course, you're a bad player. If you're a bad player, you should play, well, none. How do you play pocket kings? Under the gun. I guess we raise. Cut off calls. Flop comes king, queen, three. We continuation bet with top set. How do you approach this board on a turn seven? Probably just keep betting. Betting's fine. Betting medium is acceptable. You could also check. Check call, check. Oh, it turns to third spade. I'm sorry, I can't read. I'm sorry, turns to fourth spade. Fourth spade. Turns to fourth spade, easy check call. You have a very clear marginal made hand now. Check call turn. Uh, check river. Probably fold to river bet, although calling's acceptable as well. How should you decide if you're what your three bet percentage should be of the pot or a number of big blinds. It should be about the size of the pot in position, a little bit um, less from out of position. I'm sorry, it should be, people, sorry, people are texting me stuff. How should you decide if you should, your three, this is not a good sentence, let's see. Your three bet size should be about the size of the pot when you are deep stacked in position. It should be bigger when you're out of position, usually pot size bet plus one additional unit. The unit is the um, initial raise size. So let's say someone raises to three big blinds. You want a three bet in position deep stack. You should probably make it about nine to 10. Say you three bet out of position, it probably should be about 12 to 13. If we're shallower stack though, it should be a little bit less from both both scenarios. When, you, when the card room's open, am I gonna go back right away? I was talking to my wife about this yesterday. Like what if, all quarantine things end in, let's say, May 15th. And then the World Series of Poker is May 30th. Am I going, going to be there on May 30th for opening day? No. I don't need to do that in my life right now. I don't have to go and play poker to make money, which is, I, I get a very different scenario than what a lot of professional poker players are dealing with because a lot of them are making no money right now. And that's a tough thing for those people. It's like the people who are still working now, right? I mean, people are working at grocery stores and you know they're all going to get sick. And people are working in hospitals. You know, they're all going to get sick. People are working, um, delivering food, right? All these people are going to get sick. But they need a job, right? And it, it's tough because, like, right now in, in our country, if you have a job and you're getting paid, you should be very, very happy. And you probably don't want to screw that up. That said, if you really value your health, you're inside quarantined, right? It's always a risk reward, right? I mean, to be fair, there's no virus going around. If you really care about your health, you're like inside quarantined, even if there's no virus. So there's always risk and reward, right? When you go out to a casino, there's a chance that the casino gets robbed. There's a chance that the tournament doesn't happen correctly. There's a tournament that there's, there's always things that could happen, right? So there's always risk and reward as in all scenarios. But right now, I think the risk reward is skewed towards you should stay home. And when the casino's open, like on day one, still going to be skewed towards you should stay home because you probably don't know how the virus is going to react when crowds start happening again, unless, of course, you are a world-class virologist, which I don't think we have any of them here, although maybe we do. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst mentality. I think that's the only mentality you should have in life. Maybe not the worst, because, I mean, what is the worst? The worst is, like, society completely collapses, which is probably not going to happen. But the worst is in, you know, maybe you can't get food to New York City for the next month and a half. That could happen. So you sure better have a whole lot of food on hand, right? I mean, there's uh, there are some things you can realistically prepare for and some things you cannot realistically prepare for. And if you can't realistically prepare for something, you just have to ignore it, right? But if you can realistically prepare for some things, then you should. Like at our house, we have, what, I don't know, a month worth of food. All, like, stuff that does not expire. And... It's driving my wife nuts. She's like, why do we have all this food if you won't let me eat it? Because <laughs> I'm like, well, because we can get fresh food at the moment. So given that we can get a fresh food at the moment, um, we're not eating the food that does not go bad, right? No more than 2.5% of a portfolio in Bitcoin. Well, if you listen to some popular YouTubers, they tell you 50%. Those people um, don't last too long, though, it seems. Also, percentage of, of bankroll or portfolio Depends on the value you expect something to have, right? For example, I think Bitcoin at $3,500 is probably a substantial value to the point that I would put a lot of it in. 
but at um, 20,000, I would put none of it in, right? So it, it depends on it depends on what you think the risk reward is. Again, I'm not a professional um, cryptocurrency expert. I know a lot of people think they are, but almost no one is. So um, be careful who you listen to with that kind of advice. All right, all right, all right, let's see. Should you ever, should poker ever be an official sport? Mm, I think poker is a game. It's not necessarily a sport. If so, what fundamentals need to happen for it to be achieved? What makes a sport a sport? I don't even know what an official sport is. Like who, who says it's official? The government? I don't know. Nuts, I, I need, I don't know what your question means exactly because I don't know what an official sport is. Like if you went down a list of obscure sports, I couldn't tell you if they were sports or not. Is um, target shooting a sport? Is triathlon a sport? Is like, what is a sport? What is this? I'm not even going to Google what's an official sport. You, somebody Google what's an official sport and let me know. Like is, um, does it have to be in the Olympics to be an official sport? Right? I don't know what an official sport is. What is another big topic to tackle as far as study? I would tell you just range analysis in general, Jason. Go to poker coaching, go through all of the homework challenges starting at the earliest and work your way forward. And that's going to go a long way to making you a significantly better player. 50 big blind stacks, ace king out of position raises to 15 big blinds and gets one caller. Um, I would not open raise to 15 big blinds. I would raise to two or 2.5. Anyway, when the flop comes with an ace, you obviously put your money in the pot because you only have one pot size bet left. When you're playing very shallow stack, you just put your money in. Terrible analogy. Well, I'm full of terrible analogies every once in a while. If you're getting three to one before the flop, what range do you call with? It depends on your position, depends on your stack size, depends on your opponent's strategy, right? 47 likes only. Well, you all say, are saying I'm being mean today. So if I'm being mean today, then, um, you know, maybe we don't deserve likes. You missed the Commerce Casino. I think we're all missing any casino at this point. At this point, I think we take what we can get. Are there any overarching themes between jack deck shuffles? Like if you miss three flush draws in a row, are you more likely to hit the next one? No, because every time the deck shuffles, it's a new deal. It's They're independent events. How do you improve your consistency and concentration capacity? Get better at the game. As you get better at something, you will find that you can do it longer and you'll find that you can generally just do it over and over and over and over and over again, right? Like um, pool is a great example of this. You want to get good at pool, play a ton of pool and study pool a ton. You want to get good at baseball, play a ton of baseball, study baseball a ton. If you want to get good at um, poker, study poker a ton and play poker a ton. As you get better and better and better and you understand something more fully, you will inevitably get better and better and better at doing it. So essentially, experience and knowledge will help you do things better. Ghost of M, good morning. Hope you're having a great day. What do we think of speed games, fast forward tables, etc.? Are they profitable? They're barely profitable. What about anonymous games? I mean, look, all these games require you to play good, fundamentally sound poker. The problem, though, is that a lot of them rake a decent amount. So you have lower edges across the board. Rake is the same. And um, you're going to find that almost no one beats these games. I have a bit of inside information. I know that 95-ish um, percent of people lose at the Zoom tables, the fast-forward tables in general. So you want to try to beat the 5% that wins? Good luck. Good luck. I would definitely tell you just to play games where the... Um, play games where you, can, where you can have a decent edge. I have no clue what this word means. Let's consult Google again. We've consulted Google for definitions a few times now. All right, so this word is apparently not a word. We'll go for the next close word, closest. Argumentative, giving and expressing divergent and opposite views. And excelling at no limit hold'em, um, Liv Bory and Phil Helmuth have a chapter on playing short stack play. You are really a pessimist dude. Everything that comes out of your mouth, LOL. Yeah, maybe. I'm actually very optimistic. <laughs> Believe it or not. What are the safest online apps or websites to play poker? The licensed and regulated ones. I have a video about this at youtube.com slash poker coaching with my lawyer, Mac Verstandig. Definitely don't play on the apps. You want to play on the apps? Well, well, if you want to play on the apps, you're probably going to get shafted. So do not put 
any money on these apps where you have to go give money to some random dude on the corner or on the corner of the internet in order to play on these random sites. That is a very, very sure way to open yourself up to all sorts of legal trouble. And also your money is going to be very, very much at jeopardy. In terms of the websites, if you forced me to play on an American facing website right now today, I would play on Bovada. The reason is because they have um, done a pretty good job of skirting the law for a very long time. And that is who I would presume would keep skirting the law. That said, they could go down tomorrow and I would not be surprised in the least bit. That said, you should always play on licensed legal regulated sites like, like Party Poker, like Poker Stars, like 888, like um, World Series of Poker, like Borgata, right? But if those are not in, available where you live because your government does not like online poker and you want to play poker, you must. I guess I tell you, tell you Bo Bovada, but I definitely do not. I mean, I have zero dollars there. I would not put any money on there. How do you tell if someone flops a flush 100 big blinds deep? Well, on the river, they have to turn their cards up. And if they turn up a flush, then you know they have it. You won 20K after watching the coaching videos. Congrats, Merrick. You won 19K last week. You guys are crushing it. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad, glad, glad to hear all of you are having great results. What's my opinion on post-flop play with middling pairs and the small blind after you've three bet from with 100 big blinds deep and are called? First off, I don't think you have to three bet these hands all the time. Um, that said, the flop comes out single high card. Uh, you should be betting small and frequently with your whole range in these scenarios. So I, bet, I would continuation bet small and frequently on those boards, including the pairs. If 95% of people lose, is that basically because they can't beat the rake? Correct. Edges are so small in those games that you cannot beat those games after accounting for the rake. You feel more comfortable playing classic six tables than zoom tables. Well, yes, because you have a higher edge, right? When your edge goes up, it turns out you enjoy the game more. Poker is not a sport. Let's Google sport. Let's see what Merriam-Webster thinks a sport is. A sport is to amuse oneself. <laughs> that's, that's definition number one. Believe it or not, a sport is to amuse oneself. Can you amuse oneself playing poker? Yes, well, I guess it is a sport then. Lamb sporting in the meadow. What a bad definition. All right, let's find the noun definition. Okay, the noun is a source of diversion. What in the world's wrong with Merriam-Webster Dictionary? All right, let's try to find, find a different definition. Merriam-Webster seems to be garbage. Um, we'll consult Wikipedia. All forms of competitive physical activity or games, which, though casual or organized in participation, at least in part to aim, at least in part aim to amuse, maintain, or improve physical ability and skills while providing enjoyment of participants, and in some cases, entertainment of spectators. So the word physical is used twice in this sentence. I'm going to presume that it thinks that physicalness is important. Um, there's not a whole lot of physical demands in poker, but um, I don't know. Is it a sport? Is it a sport? I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me because like I try to not worry about things that don't matter. Is poker a sport or not a sport? I don't know. I don't care. Unless the government gives a lot of money to sports and not to non-sports, it doesn't really matter a whole lot to me. Obviously, the viewpoint of society is important, right? You want poker to be a well-liked and well-enjoyed thing and a well-accepted thing. But at the same time, we are at the point we are at. I'm talking real to all of you people who are you know, poker players who care about poker. And I don't think we have to sugarcoat stuff here for all of you. Maybe we have to for the rest of people who don't really play poker, but for all of you, we can be real in this scenario. Hopefully you all appreciate it. If you all don't, well, there's a like a, a button where you can click go to next stream usually and you can go watch somebody else. <laughs> You're being so mean today, Jonathan. Why are you being so mean? All right, when playing small stakes, there are a lot of limpers. How do you combat this in and out of position? Raise the limpers for value and then call with stuff that flops well. King Queen offsuit is acceptable to call a raise from someone in middle position if you're in the cutoff, or should you three bet it? Um, King Queen offsuit is a really good three betting hand, so I, I three bet it for the most part. Is it better play nine handed or six handed? I would recommend six handed because that is a game that you can play higher stakes at. Did I play with a straddle when I played cash games? People would straddle sometimes. 
Bovada hype. Yeah, I would definitely not play on Bovada. Um, I mean, like I said, it's, it's, it would be my, be my best choice of the sites that I would never, ever, ever play on. Again, just purely because they they are very like out there and public when they're like, yeah, we're we're breaking the rules and we don't care, and they seem to be pretty good at it. You think I'm confusing mean with honest? Yeah, well, look, delivery is important. I realize that delivery is very important when you're talking to people. <sighs> Sometimes you just don't feel like giving a nice, clean delivery. All right, I have to get going. I have a webinar for some of my students coming up, starting in. 13 minutes. I should probably figure out what I'm going to be talking about. What I'm going to be talking about. If it's on ESPN, it's a sport. There you go. That might be the best definition you can give. If it's on ESPN, it's a sport. Just like Cornhole and Magic the Gathering and Chess and Spelling Bee. Is a mental sport a sport? Is an eSport a sport? I don't know. How much is premium currently? Go to pokercoaching.com slash premium and we will let you know. Do you think Bovada is better than ACR? Uh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. By a mile. If you're going bald, do I have any tips? I don't really have any tips for people going bald. I would suggest you look into Rogaine. I hear that that works. But um, I don't know. I don't know for sure. Um, you're an early bird poker player. Well, I have two children. We have two children. You have to wake up at 6 a.m. And now here it is almost 10 a.m. So we've been up four hours already. I have to go now. I hope you all have a great day. As Kevin always says, click like, click subscribe if you enjoyed this. Everyone wants to give a definition to something that doesn't really matter a ton. Listen, everyone, whether or not poker is a sport, if you enjoy it, do it. If you don't enjoy it, because in your mind you only enjoy things that are sports, and if it's not a sport, you can't enjoy it then petition to make it a, an official sport, whatever that means. I have no idea what an official sport is. I did not even know that was a thing, but it may be. But listen, if you like something, be a good representative for it, right? A lot of people want to try to force something that people are completely oblivious about, or they want to try to make people like something just because they like it. You have to be a good ambassador for things that you want to to be portrayed in a positive light in the world, in the poker community, etc. And if you are being negative about other things, if you are trashing other things, if you are being rude to people and generally not helping others, basically if you're being a detriment to the world, do not expect the world to like the things that you like. A lot of poker players have problems with this. They are actually negative. Not just, um, you know, realistically viewing the world, but they are actually pessimistic. And they are actually trying to tear down other things. Sometimes even people in the poker community, right? We've seen plenty of people on social media trying to tear down people in the poker community. And that makes poker look bad. And if you do that on a regular basis, poker will inevitably be viewed as a well, definitely not a sport. It'll be viewed as a game for scummy people. And if you want poker to be viewed as a game for scummy people, well, then do those things. If you want poker to be viewed as an upstanding game, a game that is liked, respected, enjoyed by good, regular humans, then make sure you do your best in your life to project that. So that's all I have for today. Good luck, have fun, enjoy yourselves. Man, oh, man. I think I have a webinar on the 8th, by the way. I will look at my, sky, my calendar. Make sure you um, go to pokercoaching.com, sign up for a free trial if you're not already a member, and you'll be on my email list, and then we'll send you emails whenever we are doing webinars. We have a bunch of webinars with the coaches coming up, and I think I have two coming up this week. One with just me, and then one with a brand new poker coaching coach. I've hired the person who I think is literally the best young poker player in the world, to teach for pokercoaching.com. We'll be interviewing him later this week. So make sure you check that out. Good luck. Have fun. Enjoy yourselves. Have a great, great time. Make the most of this trying situation. And I'll talk to you all again on Wednesday. Bye-bye.